This is Phil Copeman, and I'll be talking about truths and myths about automated vehicle safety. Starting out, automated vehicle safety is complicated because you have to sort out the truth, the myths, and the it's complicated kind of answers if you really want to understand what's going on with safety here. Companies say that they are safer than human drivers, but the truth is more complicated than that, and public trust has been eroding in recent years. So let's take a look at some of the truths, some of the myths, and some of the it's complicated kind of answers to really understand this topic. Areas we'll talk about include, are automated steering features safer, even if they have human supervision? Are rover taxis safer than humans yet? And is that even the right question to be asking? Maybe there's a lot more to it than that. Hint, there is. We'll talk about some important misconceptions and other issues that still need attention. The idea that automated vehicles and autonomous vehicles will someday be safer than human drivers is a little different than where we are today. So we really need to understand where we are and where we might go and the things that are between us and getting to that rosy future where people can play board games in the car while it drives itself down the highway. Why is automated and autonomous vehicle safety so complicated? There are a lot of factors. There are public expectations. People expect superhuman safety performance from a machine far, far beyond what a human driver might do, and, and maybe that's not fair. Also, trust is too easily given. When you have a nice ride in a robotaxi and everything seems great, if there's a problem later on, you feel like your trust has been violated and the backlash can be really significant for even one adverse event, despite many thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of miles of good performance. There are technical challenges. Machine learning is still a work in progress. How to make that safe is still something people are working on. But robotaxis and other vehicles with machine learning in them are out on public roads right now. Part of this is that a statistical approach is not necessarily compatible with high severity rare events. When things are catastrophically bad but almost never happen, normal statistical approaches are not that well suited to reasoning and working with such situations. Perhaps the biggest thing is that there's a pervasive industry culture clash that still is getting worked out. Machine learning folks say 99% is a great result, and the right for machine learning, 99% is a great result. But safety is about 99.9999 and a bunch more nines, depending on the situation. And those two things are fundamentally incompatible. So when you say, we're going to use machine learning for safety, you have to have a story for how you're going to get that 99% accurate type of thing to actually be safe. Now, there are stories to be told for sure, but this is one of the reasons why this area is so difficult to match these two things up. Silicon Valley has a move fast and break things culture, and that's led to hype cycles followed by disappointment and general uh, inflated expectations that can't really be met. And that's been making it harder for the public to trust in safety in this technology. The automotive industry, for its part, uh, knows how to make cars that are reasonably safe, uh, but they spend a lot of time blaming the driver for not mitigating equipment failures. So their idea is we can have equipment that's pretty good, but doesn't need to be perfect because the driver's there to clean up the mess. And when you put a computer in charge and take out the human driver, guess what? There's no driver to clean up the mess. And the messes tend to be very rare, obscure, uh, unusual things, which is precisely the kind of thing machine learning is not great at. Finally, the regulators are very test-centric. They say, well, we're going to run, run a bunch of tests, and then that will put pressure on the automotive suppliers to do the right thing for safety. But they've been struggling with software safety for a couple decades now. And now the human driver who is in charge of cleaning up the messes in case the software made a mistake isn't there anymore. Now it's all software safety. And they're struggling with that situation. If you put these things together, it's no wonder that the industry is still maturing. And it's still going to be a while before we understand how safety for automated and autonomous vehicles is really going to turn out. If you look at the industry, they'll say safety is our number one priority, safety is urgent, safety first always, safety drives us, a new bar for safety, and so on. The industry is aggressively selling safety. And that's great, because if this technology can really make the roads safer, that's a wonderful thing. 
But along the way, there had been a lot of adverse news. Back in 2018, Uber ATG had a testing fatality when they were out trying to get their autonomous robotaxi technology working. Loco Motors had a shuttle driver injury in 2022. Pony AI had a crash where no one was injured, but the crash was severe enough that their uncrewed test permit was revoked. Easy Mile has had problems with phantom braking injuries in a couple years. Cruise and Waymo had a number of issues in San Francisco, stalling and clogging up traffic, blocking emergency responders, and a fire truck crash. And in 2023, Cruise had a pedestrian dragging injury that resulted in their testing permits being revoked and, for all practical purposes, an operational shutdown. There's been enough concerning news at this point that the public has started to have more hesitation about the technology. Public trust is eroding. Driver attitudes towards self-driving vehicles have gotten worse in the last four years. What we're here to talk about is what's going on beyond the headlines so that everyone can understand what trust we should and should not have in the companies and technologies. To begin that conversation, let's talk about the types of vehicle automation. Now, you might have heard about the infamous SAE levels, and we're not going to use those. And the reason we're not going to is that they may be useful for engineers, but they're really confusing for trying to understand to the public and trying to understand regulations and trying to understand safety outcomes. Instead, we're going to look at the role of the driver, whereas the SAE levels look at the role of technology. In the role of the driver, there are four roles the driver can play. The first is driver assistance. The person drives and the car helps. Conventional vehicles look like this. Your hands are on the wheel, you're actually steering. The car might momentarily help you avoid a crash, but you're in charge and you're actually controlling the vehicle. The next mode is supervised automation. The car mostly drives, but the person helps. Lane centering technology is the dividing line between supervised automation and driver assistance. If the car is actually controlling the steering on a sustained basis, it's supervised automation. Now the driver still has to pay attention, and despite the icon, there still might be a requirement for the driver's hands to be on the wheel. But the point is that the car is actually doing the driving, and the person is supervising the safety and helping when needed. The third mode is autonomous. The car does all of the driving, there may be nobody in it, the passenger may be asleep in the back seat, that's all fine. This is a robotaxi type technology where the car is fully autonomous, including not only driving, but all the other things that have to happen to make a car safe on the road. The fourth category is testing. And this is different than supervised automation because it is not the case the person's there just to help the technology. Yes, that's part of it, but the other part is the human driver is there to compensate for automation defects. When you're testing technology, the reason you're testing is there's a concern there might still be defects, and in practice, you expect probably there are still defects, and those defects can hurt or kill people. So doing testing is dramatically different than doing supervised automation, because the tester is there not only to fill in the gaps of the automation capability, but to also counteract potentially dangerous effects of an outright software defect that just does the wrong thing. With that understanding, let's dive into a series of truths and myths and learn more about what's really going on with this technology. <laughs> 